Do you think that rock could ever come back into the mainstream? Or is it still going to be a huge thing, but just on the outskirts? I think it still is in the mainstream. It's just not in the mainstream on the radio. Like, I, th- I still think, I bet you if you look at Spotify um, statistics, I bet you there's millions and millions of people streaming hard rock, heavy metal songs, punk songs on Spotify right now. So I think it's super popular. I just don't think that people um, hear it if they switch on the radio as much. And so that's, I don't think radio it dictates the mainstream anymore. No, I agree. Yeah. It just, in my lifetime, you know, for example, I think it was 2003 um, when We're All to Blame was big. It was... I would watch the Much Music Countdown and like I would cheer for you guys to get the number one and you got yeah. the number one, I was super stoked, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? And now it's like, I don't even know if they still have the Much Music Countdown, but yeah, probably not. But whatever those shows are, like, there's no rock. It's just like pop, you know, whatever. Yeah. Why do you think that's happened, you know? like I have no idea. Like, you know, it's kind of the age-old question of, like, you, you always have, like, there's always, like, the program director of any station any um, who gets to dictate what gets played and uh for whatever reason people that are in charge of those channels and stations are choosing more pop stuff and i don't i maybe it's has to it definitely has to probably do with um some kind of ratings there's always like a rating system you know or you know they they test songs but yeah i don't think you'd ever see like a um, Iron Maiden song Never. <laughs> uh, like the new Iron Maiden song is probably not going to be on the much music countdown next week yeah <laughs> If you were starting out today, would you approach things differently than when you did back in the early 2000s? Hard to say. I think, you know, when we were coming up, we were pretty, like, we were doing YouTube stuff before YouTube. Like, we were... Half hour power thing, right? Yeah, like, we'd have, but we'd have to go to, like, the, you know, we'd have to get these VHS tapes uh, printed up and, like, carry boxes of VHS tapes to our show and, you know, hand out, hand them out, hand them out at Warp Tour and all this stuff. So if there was YouTube back then, it would have been so much easier. So we'd probably still be doing the same stuff. Um, it would just be, the thing is, you know, we were a big radio band back then. And radio, there's not as many rock radio stations in general anymore. Um, and, you know, it's it's almost become, I don't want to say irrelevant, but in a way it kind of has. Because, you know, with, with streaming services and stuff like that, it's not, radio doesn't dictate what's big anymore. Mm-hmm. And it used to, like MTV and radio was like, if you got on those things... You're, and you were, you know, number one on rock radio, you were probably going to do pretty well. So do you think that, is that a positive or a negative that now it's more open for people? Um, I mean, I, I think the fact that you can just do whatever you want, uh, and it, you know, I mean, you can always, you can always do whatever you want. It's just nowadays you can do whatever you want and you can, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to be on a major label. You don't have to be on any label. You can kind of uh, just, you know, you can film a video on your, on your phone and put it up on YouTube the same day. So it's a little bit easier. It's just now it's, you know, there's a lot more content and people have to decide, you know, back then it was basically radio programmers dictating what you heard. So they, they would choose like, oh, I like this song, I like this song. We were lucky enough to, you know, catch that wave. But, you know, not nowadays, like I said, like radio does not even, you know, it's a thing. And it's kind of, to me, it's like more of a bonus if you're on the radio now. It's just like, oh, it's just, we're kind of on the radio now. It doesn't really mean you're going to sell tickets. You could be, a, you could have a number one hit on the radio nowadays and, and still play 300 seaters, you know. It's yeah, not, yeah. It does, it's not like the way anymore. It's just, it's just the bonus touring around the world i mean we've played in all the biggest festivals around the world you know japan summer sonic and you know germany's rock and ring rock and park and there's download festival uk we've all these big rock festivals and they are still like rock festivals you'll still get like your edm dj you'll still get a hip-hop group here and there but most of these festivals are still largely rock bands yeah that's the one thing that's always confused me is like i'm you know, I go to festivals myself and there's so many, I feel like there's more rock festivals now than there's ever been. Yeah. And in America, they still have big rock festivals. But I think maybe people also think rock is dead because it's harder for new rock bands to become big. Um, and for whatever reason, if you if you, if you you were from about 10 years ago and on and you came up or even 15 um, and you came up in the world of when record labels had... Um, still had money and they're giving big budgets and big you know hundreds of thousands of dollars for music videos and stuff like that um then i think you know you're and you came up in that era 
and were able to be successful, then you're probably still successful now. But from about 2000, I don't know, eight, nine, ten on, it's become really hard for rock bands to become because they don't have the budgets anymore. Like yeah. they don't have the promo- they don't have the marketing money. It's like all self promotion now. Um, so maybe maybe that's where it comes from too. Like there's not as many big rock bands that are new nowadays. You know, if you look at Europe, for example, there's so many huge festivals of like different styles of rock and roll. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, when you guys play overseas and stuff, is it the same feeling as when you're playing in Canada and the States? No, it is different. And the festivals are different, too, because they do these like week long. Like, you know, there's like this festival in Hungary called the Ziget Festival, and it goes all week long. And it and it's it's pretty eclectic. Like it's got rock. It's got, you know, they'll get a DJ to headline one night. They'll get, you know, Jay-Z will do one night or something. Beyonce will that's do cool. one night. But then they'll have like System of Down one night. Um, and that's why I don't really if you like that's why I really don't think rock is actually dead, because if you get these festivals in Europe and they're bringing 60 to 100,000 people there's no way that you could say rock is dead because if that many people want to see it, it's obviously alive and well. What is your relationship like with those other bands from from your scene? (laughs) Uh, Good. I mean, when we were kind of coming up, we, we wanted to be on those tours. Like we wanted to tour with no effects and we wanted to tour Pennywise. And, and, you know, I remember being 2001 when our first, when all killer came out, um, you know, we got to be on Warped Tour with all these bands and we became friends and it was like the biggest thing for us to, you know, we grew up through the 90s listening to these Southern California punk bands and now we're playing with them and they know who we are and we're hanging out with them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we were better friends with some than others and we still keep in contact with, you know, certain bands. and Fans and stuff associate us with that pop punk scene from like the late 90s, early 2000s, which is fine. I've always thought of you guys as like of the of that scene you guys are the most diverse musically because i feel like you could even art like i think chuck sounds more to me like a metal album than it does a punk album for, for example yeah right? i think so i mean yeah it's we just started getting heavier um you know all killer was written when we were teenagers so as we grew up we started liking heavier music and um and so we just like you people will still call us pop punk which is I don't really care, you know, term's a term. Um, but I don't really, if someone was to ask me, like, what, what your band sounds like, I wouldn't say pop punk. I would just say hard rock or rock. You know, it's not, you know, I would, but we, we do more hard rock and even, like, you know, fast punk stuff than we do pop punk. If you were still in music but not rock and roll, is there another genre you would have explored? Well, throughout my life, I've just, like, I've bounced around to different genres, like, right in the last like couple of years, I've really gotten into folk music. So, yeah. but you know, when I was in my twenties, I I probably hated. I didn't even know what folk music. Well, I knew what folk music was, but I was like, that'd be the furthest thing that I'd ever listen to. As I got into my like uh, mid thirties, folk music became like I was like, fuck, this stuff's amazing. So right now, I'd probably go more into that like alt country folk thing. That's cool. Just, well, you are Irish, right? I mean, that is in your Irish, your, yeah. your roots, right? <laughs> yeah. When Metallica released the Black Album, they were immediately labeled as, like, the world's biggest sellouts. Yeah. You know, as an artist, I feel like over time you, you change. So where is the line between being a sellout and just growing artistically? A sellout to me would be doing something you don't want to do just for money. That means you're selling out of what do you want to do. You're doing this other thing because you just want to make money. Um, you don't want to do it, but you're going to do it because you want to make money. So... Um, I'm pretty sure, you know, watching documentaries on Metallica and the Black Album, they wanted to do that record. So I would I would never call Metallica sellouts for doing the Black Album. Um, I think it also just comes from people just preferred Master of Puppets or, you know, Injustice for All. What are your thoughts on Kurt Cobain specifically? <laughs> um, I don't know. That's a tough one because of what happened. And I mean, he influenced my childhood more and I don't necessarily really listen to Nirvana much anymore so I don't really think about it I just remember in the early 90s he was big for me and uh, I mean the whole band was like you know my first bass was had to look like Chris Novoselic so it was very you know I was 14 so I was very impressionable um, so as a person I mean I think he was a brilliant songwriter I think he was you know he had a, an, an insane voice you know when he screamed you like he felt it Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, he was big for me. I don't necessarily listen to it anymore, but back then it was huge. Grunge, how did that influence you? 
Well, it was, I mean, at the time I was, it was the early 90s and I was, when when I went, it was going into high school, I was, was 14 and it was 1994. So Nirvana was massive at the time. They, I think they'd just come out with the In Utero. Um, so I, you know, I kind of, I think In Utero might have been before Nevermind for me because when Nevermind came out, I was 11. So I think I remember hearing, you know, I had like a grade eight dance. I might've heard like smells like teen spirit or something. At um, a dance. At a great, yeah, like a grade wow. eight dance or whatever. You know, they were playing Enter Sandman and all that kind of stuff. And Take me back to the 90s, yeah, man. Yeah. That's, like, that's awesome. So, I mean, that was the first real style of music I really got into because it was so influential back then. And, you know, it was a different thing than today. It, that's another thing about today is you don't get these bands um, like Nirvana where everyone starts dressing like them. You know, everyone, as soon as Nirvana came out, everyone had to have like the blonde hair down to the shoulders, plaid, this whole thing. It was like a whole movement of not just like, I love this band, but I want to look like this band. Do you um, think that's possible anymore with the internet and how everything's so dispersed? I don't see it anymore. Like, do you still get like your punks and your, you know, your goths and like your metal guys and they all kind of look, you can kind of say, oh, that guy probably listens to heavy metal by the way he dresses. Um, but you don't really get this thing of like a, a, a person looking like a band. Like, you know, like everyone looked like Kurt Cobain at my school. You know, there's a lot of people that had their hair long and wore red plaid and ripped jeans and, you know, and they, everyone's trying to look like Kurt Cobain. And I don't, I don't really see that anymore. Do you think that there could ever be that one huge singular band again? Uh, it's, it's tough. It's tough because it's different now. Like the, we were talking about earlier about, you know, radio and there was a lot more radio stations back, you know, in the nineties and the early two thousands. Um, and you had these program directors and they all kind of, you know, like I said, like they, they pick the songs that go on the radio and for whatever reason, you know, in 1991, whenever, when they chose Nirvana and it smells like teen spirit, everyone chose it. So it became really big, but then you also have to have, you know, the general public agree and buy into it. Um, so now that you don't really have that anymore, now you have just like YouTube and Spotify and all these streaming things, Apple Music and all this stuff. How are you going to get someone to be like, here's this new thing, everyone love it? What's the importance, if there is an importance, of community amongst bands? Yeah, I think I think it is important like because you get especially for older bands to help out young bands because it is really hard for young bands to 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 break nowadays so you need to for if you're an established older band and you can go on these good tours and bring a good crowd i think it's important to be able to bring these young bands and you know to give them years to play in front of um so we try and do like we're going on our anniversary tour in a couple of weeks and we're bringing like a, a band you know a young band um two young bands actually you know we were thinking about bringing just old cl bands like from our era but we're like you know let's give some young bands a chance you know and that's because people gave us chance like i remember being 19 being on the money by boston's tour and social social distortion took us out for a little while so you know we were in that position so like we we like to give back to young bands as well how do you balance being in a huge band and also having a family life it's well, it's new to me because while well, my son's three and everyone's conscious of, um, you know, kids and stuff now. Uh, so, you know, flying them out, um, you know, to with the Internet now, like FaceTime is a big thing. Um, so it's just kind of stuff like that. And just making sure like, you know, tours don't run <laughs> excessively yeah. long. Yeah. yeah, this is like a there's this place in Tarzana, California called Norms. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, these two touring bases that I toured with, like in 2004 or whatever. And um, he offered me, he said, if you sign these and give these to me, um, I'll give you, you know, a really expensive old base. And so he. So is I this signed, a base? This is it. This is an, this is an original 1961. Um, that's I think it was. I think he was selling it for like five grand at the time. And so cool. So. I've heard that, you know, the old guitars, the old basses, they were manufactured better. Is that the case? Yeah, I, th I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it has a lot to do with the pickups, the wood, the necks. Um, well, what's the difference now between the pickups and stuff? I think they just make them differently now. There's a wound different. Um, I think it, and it's also the wood, too. Like, you know, this wood is from 1961, <laughs> so it's like it's seen some, some stuff. That's really cool. Are yeah. you taking that on tour with you? I don't, no. <laughs>
No, I use I use uh, 59 lead issues. Jack, you know, I don't mind beating up and That's bashing so cool. around. But yeah, this is kind of my my prized bass. That's That's around. awesome. Yeah. So like, what's your uh, your main instrument? Do you have it here with you? My touring bass. Yeah. No, they're in California, but I I do I can show you the bass I played on all of the records. Sure, that would be really cool. <clears throat> this one. I did tour with this one for All Killer, and and I think for the beginning of Does It Look Infected, and then yeah, I started using it on every album. That's for so some cool. reason, this one always won, so I just was like, yeah. it sounds so good, I gotta take it off the road, or, <laughs> or I'm gonna break it one day. That's so, so cool. I just I took it off the road. Any bass players in particular influence you? Uh, not really. Like, I listen to so much stuff now, you know, when I was... Um, growing up, it would have been a lot of the grunge stuff, mm -hmm. um, and even you know, m mid '90s, late '90s, like alternative rock stuff. Um, and you know, and then once I got into punk stuff, you know, Randy from Pennywise, and you know, you just listen to all that stuff. Um, then you pick up little things, and now I just listen to so much different music that, I mean, name a bass player, I I probably like them. I think why bands, you know, and why our band has evolved and. I think what people like about us is because we do all these different styles of music. And if we if we only listen to punk and we were just a punk band, I don't think I don't think we'd have half the fan base that we have. The fact that we do little metal stuff, um, we have popular songs as well. I think it's like broadens our. Can we ever expect like a full on metal album from Sum Forty One? Probably not. Well, I mean, maybe if it was Dave, if it was <laughs> Brown Dave, Sound? then we would do that. But um, I don't really see it though. <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching. My name is Daniel Sarkissian. I'm an independent filmmaker from Toronto.